Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar on the numerical modeling of Crete. My name is Julia Hoggins, and I am the Senior Marketing Specialist at Geocomp. Today's presenter is Martin Hawks, a professional engineer and senior project engineer for Geocomp. Martin has more than 30 years of experience in geotechnical engineering. He has experience in most aspects of geotechnical engineering analysis and design. His areas of expertise include advanced numerical analysis and programming, geotechnical instrumentation, and database applications. Martin received his bachelor's degree in civil engineering from Sheffield Hallam University in the United Kingdom and master's degree in geotechnical engineering from Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT. The presentation will run for about 40 to 45 minutes, followed by a Q&A portion at the end. If you have questions during the presentation, please drop them in the Q&A section and Martin will answer your questions during that Q&A portion at the end. This webinar has been accredited as a professional engineering continuing education course by New York State and will provide one PDH to attendees. You must stay for the entire presentation to be eligible for the PDH credit. After the presentation, you will receive an email from me with five multiple choice questions that you need to answer to receive your certificate. So after you complete the questions and submit your answers back to us, you will then receive your certificate. And we will be sending the slide deck and the recording of the presentation as well. So now that we have the introduction out of the way, I'd like to hand things over to our presenter, Martin Hawks. Good afternoon. I'm Martin Hawks, a senior geotechnical engineer with Geocomp Corporation in the main office. I, I'm located in Acton, Massachusetts. I'd like to welcome you all to this webinar and thank Geocomp for giving me this opportunity to present. I have about 48 slides, which I hope to get through in about 45 minutes, um, just so you can uh, know where you are. Okay. Today's webinar discusses creep also known as viscoplasticity, and for soil, it's the same as secondary compression. Creep is defined as the slow deformation of a material under a constant and prolonged pressure or stress. This image shows bending and folding of bedrock after millions of years of creep. In this webinar, I will discuss two different projects as a framework for presenting different ways of modeling creep. The first project uses the soft soil creep model in Plaxus to model the consolidation of a deep, thick clay layer under a skyscraper. The second project models a large, deep cavern excavated in the salt for a proposed compressed air energy storage facility. For this project, we use the WIP salt model in a flak analysis. The WIP creep model was developed specifically for modeling salt creep for the waste isolation pilot project. The, this project, was for long-term storage of nuclear waste in rooms excavated in salt. These projects are not presented as case histories. I'm just using them to demonstrate numerical modeling of creep. For the webinar outcomes, I hope you gain a better understanding of the factors that affect the creep deformations in the numerical modeling, and I'd like to describe key numerical capabilities used by Geocomp to perform the analyses. My experience with projects involving creep include predicting long-term settlements of soft deposits, such as under embankments or retaining walls, reducing movements of slopes that are slowly moving downslope, either from creep or some other mechanisms, such as poor pressure buildup. I've also modeled staged construction, staged embankment construction, as a method of reducing creep. Staged construction on soft, weak, compressible deposits is a process that involves in-depth understanding of many facets of soil mechanics, including consolidation, anisotropic strength, stability analysis, lateral squeezing, and creep. In this presentation, I will first discuss the soft soil creep model, which we use for predicting the long-term settlements, including, including creep of the skyscraper in San Francisco. I will then discuss my experience with numerical modeling of creep in salt caverns. The creep model of salt at first appears very different than the soft soil creep model, but what I will attempt to demonstrate their similarities. I have not modeled, analyzed the creep deformation of the Leaning Tower of Pisa as shown in this picture. I include this image for a dramatic presentation of the long-term effects of creep. Creep is a time-related phenomenon. Therefore, modeling creep always requires stepping through time. This is different from solving in stages where each stage is related to some change in the model. 
Creep will cause changes in deformation and stress in the model as time increases, even when nothing else has changed. The rate of creep depends on deviatoric stress and over consolidation and time. Defining a single creep rate in terms of a strain or void ratio per log of time leads to much confusion about what is the appropriate time scale, especially when creep is altered from a change in construction activity. Creep is also dependent on temperature, not such an important factor for most soil modeling, but important for modeling salt caverns where the temperature may vary depending on what is being stored. For example, the cavern that I will discuss today, the temperature of the compressed air varies from 90 to 120 degrees Fahrenheit. In the WIP salt, creep, in the WIPS salt model, the creep is a function of deviatoric stress and temperature. This model forms the basic understanding of modeling of creep used for many solid single phase materials, such as steel, concrete, and salt. This model illustrates some important differences between an empirical creep model and the soft soil creep model, which considers creep rate variations with stress history and yielding. The images on this slide represent the formulation of the two models. The WIT model is what is called the rheological model. based on considering a combination of linear springs, viscous dash pots, and the soft soil crow model is, a, is based on a yield surface that grows with creep. In the image, the yield surface for the soft soil model is shown plotted in 3D space, defined by the major principal stresses, sigma one, sigma two, and sigma three. In classic creep models, imagine the model depicted by springs and dash pots subject to a constant stress. The dash pot is a viscous element in which the behavior is time dependent and deformations are plastic. In this model, there is an initial elastic strain followed by primary creep and then steady state creep. Steady state creep continues at a constant rate of strain per day. The total strain is the sum of elastic strain, primary creep, and steady state creep. If the stress is increased, the strain increases and the rate of steady state creep increases. If the creep reaches a threshold rate, then at some strain, the creep rate increases rapidly until failure. The increased creep rate is told tertiary creep. The takeaway here is, as stress increases, the creep rate increases. If the creep rate reaches a threshold rate at some level of strain, it leads to tertiary creep resulting in failure. Now that I've given you a classic perspective of creep, let's dive into the soft soil creep model. I use the soft soil creep model to compute the long-term settlements of a skyscraper underlined by a deep overconsolidated clay in San Francisco. The analysis for this project was performed for litigation purposes, so I'm only presenting publicly available information and testing information on the deep clay layer. The tower is founded on a pile-supported mat foundation. There are about 900 concrete piles spaced about four feet apart, which were driven 80 feet to a dense layer known as the coma sand. The dense layer is underlain by about 140 feet of all bay clay. The presentation will use the information from a depth of about 110 feet located approximately as shown by the blue dot. This slide shows an estimate of the change in vertical stress in the soils beneath the tower based on an axisymmetric plexus model, which includes the pile supported mat and basement walls. The gross tower bearing pressure on the mat is about 14,800 pounds per square foot. The pressure reaching the Old Bay clay is reduced by the uplift soil and water pressures on the underside of the mat, friction on the basement walls, friction on the piles, and a redistribution of loads by the bearing sand layer. As a result of the, all this load redistribution, the net increase in the vertical stress on the top of the clay is calculated to be about 5,000 PSF. This slide shows the results of a typical 1D consolidation test or odometer test performing a sample located from the old blade clay at about the location we're discussing. Uh, 
From this test, we can determine the compression parameters. The recompression ratio. The compression ratio and the swell ratio. In the analysis, we usually set the swell ratio equal to the recompression ratio. The stress at which recompression changes to compression is called the preconsolidation stress or maximum pass pressure. The estimated preconsolidation from this test is about 10,800 PSF. The in situ vertical stress at the sample location is estimated to be about 6,600 PSF, as shown by the, the green arrow. The net increase from the tower construction is about 5,000 PSF, as we calculated in the axisymmetric model, for a total stress of about 11,600 PSF. The overconsolidation ratio, or OCR, is defined as the ratio of the preconsolidation stress to the current effective stress. The OCR from this test is calculated to be about 1.6. Note that the final consolidated stress from the tower increases the OCR from a starting OCR of about 1.6 to a final OCR of 1.0. If the OCR is greater than one, the soil is said to be over consolidated. If it is equal to one, the soil is said to be normally consolidated. For this test, the load on each increment was maintained for 24 hours as specified by ASTM D2435 method A. This plot shows the strain versus log data for one of the overconsolidated load increments. To determine the creep rate from this test, we first need to determine the time for the end of primary consolidation when pore pressure dissipation is complete. Once pore pressure dissipation is complete, the ongoing deformations are from secondary compression, which is also called creep. The time or 90% consolidation in this example is determined using the Taylor's construction on the square root of time plot. Both of these plots are show the same data. This is square root of time, and this is the log of time. The time for, to use the Taylor construction, we first determine the best fit of line, best fit line to the first portion of the square root of time curve. We then offset the best fit line with a line of a slope of about 1.5 times the best fit line. That would be the green line is offset from the blue line by 1.15 increase in slope. The time where the offset line intercepts the measured data right about here is the time for 90% consolidation, also known as T90. For this example, the T90 is 22 minutes as shown on the plots. Secondary compression or creep is determined from the slope of the log of time curve for times greater than T90. So the slope right in here. We add a subscript epsilon to the notation for C alpha. So it is known that this slope refers to strain because the same notation is used for slopes, which refer to void ratio, leading to a lot of confusion and possible error. For this load increment, the C alpha epsilon is computed to be 0.13. The coefficient of consolidation, which governs the time to the end of primary consolidation, is computed from equations developed from Tetzaghi's 1D theory of consolidation. For this load increment, the coefficient of consolidation is computed to be 0.07 square foot per day. Method B of the test standard for 1D consolidation requires the acquisition of load increment time plots for all load increments. This plot shows strain versus log time data for several load increments maintained for 24 hours. This is uh, 1,444 is 24 hours. Um, plot also shows increasing rate of creep with increasing vertical stress with large increases occurring in the normally consolidated range. The plot shows increasing time for the end of primary as the sample becomes normally consolidated, over consolidated as, a, as, a, as, a, as it becomes normally consolidated, over consolidated um, soils cons consolidate faster than normally consolidated. Note that the Primary consolidation and creep is included in the end of the 24-hour increment. 
So if we use the end of this increment includes primary consolidation and secondary compression. Using the method shown in the previous slide, the strain versus logs grass for the 24 hour increment, which is the curve we saw before, and the end of primary increment, which is the dotted line, can be compared. Note that the end of primary curve will lie above the 24 hour curve. The difference between the end of primary curve and the 24 hour curve is creep. Also note that the preconsolidation stress determined from the end of primary will always be greater to that from the 24 hour increment. In this case, the preconsolidation stress from the 24 hour increment is 10,800 PSF and using the end of primary, it is about 13,700 PSF. The OCR using end of primary is about 2.1. This is greater than the OCR equals 1.6 using the end of the 24 hour increment. This is an important point to remember because the soft soil creep model has a built in time constant of one day. And therefore, the preconsolidation stress must be entered as that corresponding to a one day increment. So the OCR for this um, in the soft soil creep model is 1.6. This plot shows the change in coefficient of consolidation and secondary compression versus log of stress for six different loading steps ranging from the overconsolidated to the normally consolidated range. Note that CV is not a constant and shows a large increase when going from overconsolidated to normally consolidated. The large decrease. CV is higher for overconsolidated and smaller for normally consolidated. The plot also shows a large increase in creep or C alpha when going from overconsolidated to normally consolidated. Normally consolidated salts will have a far greater creep rates than overconsolidated salts. Now that we have determined the stress history of the clay, we can go back to the stress distributions and calculate the skyscraper foundation, the stress distributions calculated for the skyscraper foundation and estimate the area of clay, which becomes normally consolidated when the tower loads are applied. The volume of clay shown in brown is loaded into the normally consolidation range. From what we have learned from the consolidation tests, the primary consolidation magnitude will be larger, the time for primary consolidation will be longer and the creep rate will be larger. This is the result for a simple axisymmetric model. The stretch change from a full 3D model, including changes in stratigraphy, groundwater, and adjacent structures will be much more complex. These relationships between creep and stress rate is much more complicated than what's going to be going on in the WIT model that I'll show you next. So let's see how the soft soil creep model handles all these details. This slide presents the soft soil creep parameters determined from the consolidation test discussed in the previous slide. Note that the coefficient of consolidation, CV, is not an input parameter. This is because the coefficient of consolidation is defined as the ratio of permeability to compressibility. And the model already includes um, permeability parameters and compressibility parameters. Where compressibility is determined in, in terms of, to quote Lam and Whitman, still another term used to describe the stress grain behavior in confined compression is the coefficient of volume change, unquote. I now have some idea how, how he felt. There are several parameters that all define the same um, basic uh, geotechnical parameter compressibility. MV is just another linear variation of the coefficient of consolidation shown by this equation on the slide. To investigate the behavior of the soft soil creep model, we created a model that reproduces the conditions of the 1D consolidation test. The model is an axisymmetric model with a horizontal line of symmetry at the base. The model represents a disk of soil one inch high with a diameter of two and three quarter inches. The same dimensions are used in the 1D consolidation test. For the initialization of the stress in the model, we included an overburden layer 0.1 feet high, which was given a density sufficient to apply a vertical stress of about 6,600 PSF. The reason the, the model is set up this way is because Plaxis initializes the OCR in the initial calculation phase, but the initial phase cannot contain externally applied loads, so the overburden stress needs to be applied using a pseudo-material weight. 
after gravity turn on with the with the pseudo material weight, the surcharge soil is deactivated and replaced with a load. The incremental load increase increases to the loads that are applied. The, the incremental load increases to a load in a plastic analysis step, followed by a 24 hour consolidation step for each increment. The load increments are set equal to the load increment used in the 1D consolidation test, so we can compare the behavior of the model with that of the laboratory test. The blue circles on this plot show the load versus strain computed by Plaxis. The, the load shows the plot shows little deformation as the load is applied suddenly. These are the horizontal um, um, orange lines, and then as the pore pressure dissipate, the sample consolidates and creeps for 24 hours. And ends up close to the 24 hour incremental plot um, as measured in the laboratory. Using the exact same methods to interpret the Plaxis time deformation data as we did for the laboratory consolidation data, we can compute the coefficient of secondary consolidation. The C alpha values computed from the Plaxis results are shown in black. The laboratory me measured values are shown in blue, green, and orange. The soft soil creep model approximates the measured variation in creep with stress level reasonably well. However, as shown in this plot, the Plaxis model, shown in black, overpredicts the coefficient of consolidation for normally consolidated stress levels. This means that the Plaxis model will dissipate pore pressures more rapidly than the laboratory measured response. However, we can adjust the model to account for this. As said before, the coefficient of consolidation is proportional to the ratio of permeability over compressibility. To better estimate the rate of consolidation, the permeability of the Old Bay Clay, Old Bay clay can be made dependent on the void ratio. As the void ratio decreases during consolidation, the permeability will decrease, and hence the coefficient of consolidation will decrease. This slide shows the results of a constant rate of strain test performed by Arup on a sample of the Old Bay clay at a depth of 116 feet. In the constant rate of strain test, the load is increased or decreased at a constant rate, and hydraulic conductivity can be calculated and plotted versus void ratio. The figure shows how hydraulic conductivity decreases with decreasing void ratio. Plaxis has a permeability coefficient, CK, that makes permeability vary with void ratio. Using the data from CRS tests, we determined a value of about 0.3 is appropriate. This slide shows how the updated coefficient co consolidation versus vertical stress for analysis where CK is equal to 0.3. Again, Plaxis results are shown with gray triangle with black line. The match is much better in the normally consolidated range. Now that we have the soft soil creep parameters matching the laboratory results, we can look closer at the relationship between creep deformations and OCR in the soft soil creep model. This slide shows the effective stress for the same plaxis simulation we have been considering. The following set of slides will focus on the behavior of the load increment shown inside this blue box. The plot shows a zoomed in area of one of the normally consolidated increments. The incremental increase in stress starts after the previous load increment has been in place for 24 hours. When the load increment is activated, the effective stress increases until the end of primary consolidation line is reached. Primary consolidation line is followed while pore pressures dissipate. Then the soil creeps and ends up on the one day line after 24 hours. The process is repeated for the next load increment. Green line on the plot shows what happens if the load increment is increased to 10 days. The load is still activated suddenly, but the soil is allowed to creep for an extra nine days. The soil now creeps to a new line parallel with the one day line shown here as the 10 day creep line. Using a one year increment produces another parallel line. Note that the initial slope of each loading increment is at the recompression slope. The slope of the constant rate of creep contours are at the normal consolidation slope. The spacing between the constant rate of creep contours is determined by C alpha. The soft soil creep model is a type of isotac model where the parallel lines of constant creep rates are called isotacs. It is useful for understanding the relationship between creep rate and OCR that occurs in the soft soil creep model. As time passes in the model, the soil constantly creeps further away from the end of primary curve. 
As time passes, the OCR is constantly increasing. The soft soil creep formulation of creep is shown by this equation. I use the approximate symbol because Plaxus uses recompression parameters based on void ratio instead of strain and the natural log of stress instead of log of stress. I now like to try and resolve one of the key takeaways from this webinar that I stated at the start of the webinar, that creep rates are governed by deviatoric stresses. For the width soil model, as we'll see later, it is included in the formulation, while in the soft soil creep model, the only stress-related parameter appears to be the OCR. Deviator stress dependency of the soft soil creep model is best represented visually. Consider a K0 consolidated soil, like in the, this consolidation test. The OCR in Plaxus is defined as the ratio of the equivalent isotropic stress to the equivalent preconsolidation stress, where the isotropic preconsolidation stress is the intercept of the yield cap on the isotropic axis. And the equivalent isotropic stress is the intercept of the current state of stress on the isotropic axis. For a normally consolidated stress, the point is on the cap. Creep causes the cap to be in constant growing motion. The rate of keep of crap growth depends on the OCR. The lower the OCR, the closer the current stress state is to the cap. Stress rates closer to the cap cause the cap to move faster. And the faster the cap moves, the faster the soil creeps. Now consider the equivalent isotropic stress for a sample with increasing deviator stress. As the deviator stress increases, the equivalent isotropic stress moves closer to the cap. This point moving closer to this. The OCR decreases and the creep rate will increase. Combining shear stress dependent creep into a soft model into a model that also has stress history dependent creep is what makes the soft soil creep model a powerful tool. The downside is that the relationship between creep and stress state is very complex and the resulting creep rates are often hard to interpret and understand. So the cap is always an emotion. The closer you move to the cap, the faster the cap moves. This slide shows a plaxis simulation of an undrained triaxial test using the same creep parameters we've been discussing. So this is a plaxis simulation. In this simulation, the soil is, isotropic, is consolidated anisotropically. This results in a normalized shear stress ratio of about 0 0.2. So right here, like on the, in the consolidation test, we start here. The soil is undrained. The creep results in a buildup of pore pressure. The deviator stress is held constant and the mean effective stress in the sample decreases. The soil creeps along the orange line for one year. The simulation is then repeated with the deviator stress increased to give a normally stress ratio of about 0 0.2 and allowed to again allowed to creep for one year. The same is repeated with a normalized stress ratio of 0.24. The simulation at 0.24 reaches the failure envelope and the soil fails in shear. This slide shows the creep rates for the three simulations on the previous slide. This shows that the soft soil creep model does indeed incorporate deviator stress dependent creep rate. As the deviator stress increases, the creep rate increases. These results look very similar to the deviator dependent creep plot that I showed at the start of the presentation. For increasing stress, the creep rate is increased, and if the creep rate reaches a certain level, it will lead to tertiary failure. Before I switch gears and move to the salt cavern analysis, Let's summarize what I've discussed so far. Overconsolidation ratio is the ratio of the maximum pass pressure to the current effective stress. The soft soil creep model uses isotropic stress to calculate the OCR. The rate of creep depends on the OCR. The initial OCR used in Plaxus includes one day of primary consolidation and creep. The OCR is constantly creeping, increasing as time goes by, and the creep rate is greatest when the OCR equals one. The creep rate in the soft soil creep model is deviatoric stress dependent. Now we will switch gears and I will talk about the compressor energy storage, which uses a totally different kind of uh, creep model. 
I used the whip creep model for deformation analysis of a salt cavern for a compressed air energy storage project. The cavern is proposed to be located in a salt dome. Salt domes form when the deposit of salt intrudes upwards through the overlying rock. The salt dome near Delta, Utah is approximately 3,000 feet deep and one mile thick and about three miles wide. Stable cylindrical caverns hundreds of feet wide and thousands of feet tall are routinely excavated in salt domes. The national reserves of salt and natural gas are stored in caverns excavated in salt domes. The caverns are excavated by drilling a borehole down to the bottom of the cavern. Down here, this would be the cavern. Fresh water is then circulated from the bottom of the pipe within the borehole. The salt is dissolved and the salt water, known as brine, is transferred to the surface. By controlling the flow of water and the level injection pipe, the geometry of the cavern can be controlled. At the time of our study, five salt caverns were in operation for storing liquid fuels on the site. The client was investigating the feasibility of a compressed air energy storage facility. In compressed air energy storage, off-peak electricity is used to compress air, which is stored, for large stored in a large underground cavern. When the peak energy is needed, air is released and drives the turbine to create electricity. For modeling of the cavern, we used the whip creep model in, plaques, in FLAC. The whip creep formulation is given by a power law where the steady state creep is related to a material constant D multiplied by shear stress to the power N. The QRT part of the equation gives the creep rate temperature dependency, where Q is the activation energy. P is the temperature in degrees Kelvin, and R is the universal gas constant. The stress is the mon Weiss's stress. For triaxial stress conditions, sigma 1 and sigma 3 are equal, and von Mises stress is the same as the deviator stress. For the Utah Pilot Program, Pilot Compressed Air Energy Storage Project, geomechanical studies were completed by Sandia National Laboratories from samples of the coarse salt. Sandia performed 12 triaxial compression constant stress creep tests. In these tests, the samples were isotropically confined, the vertical stress was increased and maintained while the changes in the axial and radial dimensions were measured. The plot shows a typical creep test performed with salt sample with a confining pressure of 4,000 PSI, a deviator stress of 4, 3,450 PSI at 60 degrees Celsius. This plot shows axial strain, radial strain, volumetric strain computed from axial and radial strain, and strain rate, which is the slope of the volumetric of the axial strain. Note that the volumetric strain for this test is negative, meaning compressive. A steady state creep rate of 3.49 times 10 to the minus second was determined. The material constants for the whip creep model are determined by curve fitting the measured creep rates with the creep rates calculated using the formula. To do this, we plot the measured steady state strain rate versus the deviator stress on log normal plot. At 3,420 PSI, the creep rate from this test is uh, 3.49 times 10 to the minus seven per second. Eight other tests were performed at the same temperature and confining stress, but with different deviator stresses. The plot shows the relationship between log creep rate and deviator stress at 60 degrees Celsius. As noted, the creep rate increases with deviator stress. The parameter D and N are determined by curve fitting to the data to the whip creep equation. The parameter Q varies by material and is 13,200 calories per mole for rock salt. R is the universal gas constant. Few tests were performed at 40 degrees and 50 degrees. No, 40 degrees, and this one falls down here at 50. Um, the plot shows creep rate increases with temperature. An important thing to note about the whip creep mo model is that it does not include a failure criteria. There is no upper bound to the deviatoric stress included in the model. As I mentioned in a previous slide, it is important to limit deviatoric stress to a value that does not lead to tertiary creep. Plot on the right shows a schematic of the failure service. This is in 3D space. 
This is shown as a Drucker Prager surface. The blue and orange lines show two parallel axes, two axes parallel and perpendicular to the axis of the conical failure surface. The blue axis is a measure of the mean confining stress, and the orange axis is a measure of the deviatoric stress. The Drucker Prager failure surface is like the more familiar, more cooler failure surface, but it's this time defined using the stress invariants J2 and Ji1 where J2 is a measure of the deviatory st shear stress and I1 is a measure of the mean stress. The drucker prager model is used because the deviatory stress parameter J2 is directly proportioned to the von Mises stress, which is used in the creep formula. The chart on the left shows a slice along the blue and orange axes. The orange dots show the failure surface of triaxial tests on the salt performed at constant mean stress. The black axes show the onset of dilation from each one of these tests when the sample volume starts to increase rather than being contractive, the sample starts to be dilative. To avoid tertiary creep, the stress level should be below the dilation limit. For the cavern analysis, we selected a ratio of deviatoric to confining stress of 0.18 as shown by the green dashed line. One of the goals of the cavern design is to select a range of operating pressures that ensure that the maximum stresses are below the green line or the dilation limit. The creep tests on the salt were performed at stresses below the dilation limit. Now that we've discussed the basics of the WIP model, I'll briefly show some details of the cavern analysis. The analysis was performed using the finite different program FLAC from Itasca Consulting. FLAC was selected because it contains a well-documented version of the WIP model and because it models thermodynamics. Thermodynamic is important because the temperature of the air in the cavern changes as the air pressure is cycled. The model shown on this slide is an axisymmetric model. In an axisymmetric model, the units of dimensions in and out of the screen are in radians, and the governing equations are solved using plane radial strain. In this type of analysis, every radial slice of the model is identical. This works well for geometries which are radially symmetrical. The cavern is 13,080 feet high with a radius of 144 feet. The top of the cavern was modeled as an ellipsoid and the bottle, bottom was modeled as a cone and the center would form a cylinder. The model includes a claystone anomaly at about two thirds height. The total volume of the cavern is 11.5 million barrels, including insoluble material collected at the sump area. As a point of interest, the unit BBL is not a standard 55-gallon drum, but a 45-gallon drum. The term BBL is thought to originate from a 42-gallon blue barrel used by the standard oil industry in the early 1860s. The analysis was performed in stages, starting with the in-situ overburden stress first applied to the top of the model. The horizontal stresses were computed from elastic parameters and compared with the measured initial horizontal stresses determined using hydraulic fracturing methods, which are shown by the blue dots. The orange line is, shows the lithostatic stress. This is the vertical stress from the weight of soil and rock. So it can be seen that the horizontal stresses for the salt are about equal to the vertical stresses, um, which makes sense because it has creep for millions of years and uh, the, the stresses of um, deviatory stresses have become zero. The first step excavated the access pipe under the pressure of the brine to the top of the cavern. The cavern was then excavated under pressure of the brine expanding outwards until the final cavern geometry was formed. The excavation of the, ca of the cavern was modeled. The goal was to determine an upper allower, allowable acceptable working pressure for the cavern, a parameter which we call the DPR, for damage potential ratio was defined as the ratio of the current deviatoric stress in, in the model to the stress below which tertiary creep is avoided. The DPR was defined so that the ratio of 0 0.18 was equal to a DPR1. A DPR equal to 1 corresponds to a stress condition at the dilation limit. The DPR was computed using the FLAC model for several cavern pressures. The plot on the right is a contour plot of DPR with for a cavern pressure of 15,095 PSI. The plot shows areas of higher stress in red. The red areas have the potential to be dilated and creep rates bordering on tertiary. The volume of the model with DPR equal one was computed and plotted as a percent of the ca total cavern volume versus cavern pressure. 
the minimum pressure was selected as the pressure at which the DPR started to increase. The maximum pressure is limited by Utah state regulations to 90% of the in situ stresses. The working pressure for the cavern was selected between these pressures based on the capabilities of the compressor and economic factors. Once the minimum and maximum cavern pressures were determined, several possible cavern pressurization and depressurization schemes were determined by the client based on economic factors such as power availability, demand and cost, and capacity to pressurize and depressurize the, ca the cavern. This slide shows one possible scenario. The green line is based on a weekly cycle of power generation and depressurization of the cavern, starting with the cavern fully pressurized at the maximum operating pressure, there are five cycles of power generation, followed by two days of pressurizing the cavern back to the maximum pressure. This was just one potential um, cycle. There were several um, different cycles um, analyzed. The temperature of the air in the cavern, shown by the blue line, is computed from the pressure and volume. Over time, the salt will creep as it adjusts to the change in stress and temperature. The next stage analysis involves determination of the cavern co closure rate. On the left shows the inward displacement of the cavern wall over a one year period. The initial portion of the plot shows the displacements that occurred during the cavern excavation and pressurization to the maximum design pressure for, and held for one month. The fo following which the pressure is cycled using weekly pressure temperature loading for a year. Using this information from all the points on the surface of the cavern allows the determination of the percent volume loss of the cavern and the rate at which volume is lost. The plot on the right shows that the closure rate reaches a steady state rate of about one quarter percent of, of the total ca cavern volume after about two years of operating the cavern. This slide shows the salt temperature versus distance from the cavern wall one year after cycling the pressure. The slide shows that the temperature effects beyond about 30 feet are negligible. In summary, the whip creep model is far simpler than the soft soil creep model, but the advantage is that the creep rates are directly cal calibrated to the deviatoric stress and temperature. The rate of creep in the whip creep model depends on the deviatoric stress and temperature. The model is formulated using von Mises stress, and the design should include a limiting von Mises stress that minimizes the risk of tertiary creep. I hope you now understand key differences between numerical models of creep and calculations based on 1D consolidation, and I've learned some of the numeric modeling capabilities used by GICOM to perform complex analyses. I hope you've learned at least one thing from this presentation, even if it is what BBL stands for, and I hope that it has deepened your understanding of the numerical modeling of creep. Thank you for attending, and I will now take any questions you may have. Awesome. Thank you, Martin, so much for that very informative presentation. Um, we do have a couple of questions that have come in, but if anyone has any outstanding that they meant to submit during the presentation, please feel free to drop them in the Q&A section now. Uh, the first question is, you mentioned that creep depends on deviatoric stress. Do the models show creep for isotropic stress? Well, the the the, um, the WIP model would not show um, creep deformations for isotropic stress because it only has um, deviatoric um, um, von Mises stress in it. So that would be zero for a complete state of uh, isotropic stress with a creep rate of zero. The soft soil creep model, though, um, would still calculate um, an OCR, you know, on on from the isotropic stress and would would in fact um, creep with under an isotropic stress. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah, no, thanks for that. Uh, next question. I know you can't say much about the tower settlement project because of litigation, but what can you tell us about the importance of creep, creep in the amount of long term settlement? Well, I can say it's complicated and um, it got really complicated. Um, we did do a 3D model for this and which included like, you know, much more complex changes in stress state. And as you can see from the presentation, the um, the increase in load is um, very sensitive to where the OCR is and the stress changes, so um, the, 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 it's very sensitive to that. And um, uh, 
one big concern was that the, the clay is, is very thick and um, the creep, as I showed in the last slide, um, undrained creep increases pore pressure. So this in effect reduces primary consolidation. So um, it's hard to separate the slowdown of primary consolidation from the effect of creep. But the bottom line was that, you know, we'd, we'd get a much better model um, prediction of the tower settlement if we used um, a model that incorporated creep, which is why we did. Um, and then this last one that we have, do you know if the compressed air energy storage project was built? Well, our study was a pilot, a pilot study, and the purpose of that pilot study was for funding of the compressed air energy storage. Um, our client is still active on this site. Um, um, like I said, there are five caverns on that site that are currently used. Um, instead of using compressed air energy storage now, they've changed their their um, their um, abbreviation to advanced clean energy storage and they're currently looking at storing um, and, and getting funding still for storage of uh, hydrogen hydrogen gas in the um, for clean it so they're more clean energy orientated um, which w compressed air energy was too but I think it comes down to uh, what they could get funding for so they're still seeking funding for this great well, that's all the questions that we have for now. Um, but if anyone has any additional ones, please feel free to drop them in the Q&A. Um, I'll just do a couple closing remarks and reminders um, about the PDH and certificate and all that, and then we'll wrap it up. So um, for those of you that may have missed the beginning introduction for the presentation, um, this afternoon I will be sending all the attendees the five multiple choice questions um, that you'll have to answer to, in order to receive your PDH certificate. Um, but I will also be sending the slide deck that Martin um, so graciously gave us today and the recording as well of this presentation. Um, so if you have any additional questions for Martin as well, his contact information is on the screen. Um, and then in, on a side note, um, so Geocomp is always happy to um, have sponsored such webinar events. Uh, we are planning to do them quarterly, so keep an eye out for the next um, webinar that we will have next quarter. Um, and we're also always looking for more talented individuals like Martin, who is a very intelligent and knowledgeable engineer. Um, so we're always looking for people to join our growing team. And if you are interested, we have a few open positions listed on our careers page. So just visit our website, uh, www.geocomp.com for more information. Um, and take a look at some of those open positions. Um, let's see if there's any other questions. I think we are good. So thank you so much for everyone who attended and Martin for that amazing presentation. Um, and stay tuned all thank of you, you for the PDH questions and I will be sending them along very soon. Thank you all.